Good morning and welcome to Community Connections with Children's Services Council of St. Lucie County. I am just one of your remote team hosts, Sean Boyle, and with me is... Ashley Mock. We're having too much fun with that word remote. I know. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, we're getting there, I guess. <laughs> we're totally getting it. All right. So welcome to the half hour radio program on 104.5 The Flame every Sunday at 10 a.m. But also because during a pandemic, we had to figure out how to use Zoom. <laughs> rather quickly. We also are publishing the video of this show on our Facebook page at 11 o'clock every day, every Sunday after the show airs. So if you want to see what these faces look like, here's your shot with a word of caution as always. But uh, we at the Children's Services Council of St. Lucie County, of which Ashley and I work at, uh, we are not radio show and or Zoom professionals, but we're working on it. But what we do at the Children's Services Council is five things for our community. And those five things are one, make sure every baby's a healthy baby. Two, to stop child abuse before it happens. Three, to keep kids off the streets. Four, to keep them in school. And five, to keep them off drugs, alcohol, and other risky behaviors by offering programs and resources for all families in our community. And we spend this time together to inform you, the listener and viewer, about those things that are available. I liked your air quotes. Nobody could see that, but your and viewer. <laughs> Um, so Sean talked about those priority areas. The best way to get information about those programs that work in those areas is on our website, which is cscslc.org. We have a list of all of the programs there along with contact information. So anything that you are looking for, you can find there. And anything that you can't find there, you can always call us and ask about. So we say on the show pretty frequently that we get a lot of questions via Facebook and that is still true. Um, people reach out saying, hey, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for this. And if it's not one of the programs that we work directly with, we can usually point you in the right direction. So if there's something out there that you are looking for and you can't find it, please do that so that we can get you pointed in the right direction. Um, I did just want to point out one of the things that I'm, I can't remember if we talked about this last week or not. I know it was kind of new still, um, but through a partnership that we have as a grade level reading community and the Florida campaign for grade level reading um, has formed a partnership with Nickelodeon and their Noggin app, which is a learning platform for children ages two to six. Um, we actually have the ability to offer free Noggin subscriptions to our St. Lucie County residents, which is amazing. So right on our homepage, there's a little box that says free Noggin app access, and you can click in there and get a link that will take you to a free subscription for 90 days. Plus, if you sign up this month before the end of the month, um, they will extend that subscription through the end of the year. So it's something that we're really excited about it. Um, I know we've shared, we've shared it on social media. Lots of local partners have shared it as well. So we really hope that a lot of our residents take advantage of it because it is a really cool app. Um, there are eBooks, there's videos, there are interactive games. They give um, parents advice on things to do to boost their child's learning. Um, it's just a really cool app and it's a really great opportunity um, to get it for free. Yeah, and, and your kids love Noggin and Nickelodeon, right? Yes, Paw we are Patrol big fans of Paw Patrol at my house. Um, we're big fans of Peppa when they were a little bit younger. So they're, the, all of the learning aspects of the app are taught by characters that the kids will recognize. So it's a really cool, really cool platform. So if you're, if you're listening, you have children and grandchildren in the target age, if, correct me if I'm wrong, is around two to six years old? Yep. And so, you know, just mention Paw Patrol to if you have a child <laughs> two to six and see if they light up. And if they do, make sure you have to use the link that's on our website to get the full Correct. 90 days. And my understanding is if they sign up through June, that's actually extended to the end of December. Correct. Yeah. And the important thing and the thing that appeals to me, because, you know, anytime you see something's free, you're like, yeah, but they want my credit card, right? And right. it's free, but then if I don't cancel it, if I don't think about canceling it, they're going to charge and then it becomes a hassle. So sometimes you don't sign up, but this, there is no credit card. There is no strings. No. It's a straight sign up free, no obligation. That's right. And I would caution you, like if you somehow come across the link and you try to get on there and it is asking for credit card information, you have chosen the wrong link. You need to come back to our website to find the one that will give you the free subscription for 90 days. 
So another thing uh, before we get to our guests, because, you know, we, we've quickly realized our half hour radio program goes really fast. Yeah. And when we think we have time, just when we get into it good with the guests, we're like, yeah, we got to wrap it up. <laughs> so real couple of real quick announcements, and they both involve the United Way indirectly and directly. So first of all, Children's Services Council, a lot of with a lot of its program partners, the school district, the round table and the United Way of St. Lucie County are working on a, kind of an exciting thing. Right now, the tentative title is Rising Star Saturdays. That could change. Cause literally, we, we cooked that up about two hours before we went live. But we are, we are securing locations at our funded programs to offer educational booster shots, if you will, for children on Saturdays. So if your child is in elementary school, and let's say they've been targeted for that specific curriculum, you're going to have access to a computer for your child to get onto, or if they just need, you know, a safe place to go on Saturday for a couple of hours, why maybe you make some, run some errands and, you know, they're going to get some education and learning in there. Or if you have an older kid that, older child, I should say, that needs credit retrieval, like eighth grade and older, they can access that. Um, so we're going to, uh, we're going to outline the plan in the next week or so and start marketing it, but it's going to be free. Um, and it is targeting all kids in St. Lucie County. And we are trying to make sure that we have locations uh, across the county and particularly with schools that maybe we know have struggling students. Um, so stay tuned to that, pretty excited about that. And United Way has jumped on as a partner, partner and we're really grateful for that. And then speaking of the United Way and us jumping on a partnership with them is um, our good friend who's been on our show the last two weeks, Crystal Morris, uh, does an amazing implicit bias training um, she's trained us. I know she's done some training with some of our programs. Um, the United Way has a vehicle called the United Women's Lunch Luncheon, where they bring in guest speakers. They're going to do that virtually on July 10th, and we are proud to be the be in partnership with them to make that happen. So as that gets closer, you're going to see a lot of uh, social media and advertisement. We're going to talk about it, but July 10th, um, if you happen to be able to be at a computer and can watch the implicit bias training by Crystal Morris, it is, uh, it's pretty phenomenal. It's, it's very good. I think you and I have both commented. It's not the first time that we've been through a training like that on that topic. Um, but I think I told you her training impacted me way more um, than any that I had ever been through before. So it's, it's very, very good, very powerful. Yeah. And then, it can't be, a, a, I'll call this our cold opening of the show because I've been watching too much late night TV. Our cold <laughs> opening, we can't uh, have a show without saying, did you fill out your census? We're just asking because we demand that you fill out your census to make sure that we get our fair share, um, not only in representation, but that representation equates to formulas and funding formulas. And we want to make sure everybody's counted, especially children, because we want to make sure that that money comes down for our schools and infrastructure and all that good stuff. Now we've been yeah. talking about it so much. Everybody thinks that our money depends on the census. That's not true. We just it's care not. so much about it because we understand that it lays the foundation for a lot of the stuff that we build upon through our efforts at the children's services council. So please, please, please complete your census information. It helps our money. Our, it helps our money. <laughs> we leverage it. We get right. more money for our community. That's why we like it. All right. So, I'm going to bring in the guests who have been waiting patiently in our luxurious Zoom waiting room. <laughs> Very fancy there. And I'll just kind of give the, the backdrop here. So you, if you're watching, you will recognize these two people, I am certain. Um, but, you know, if you've tuned in the last couple of weeks, we've obviously started this conversation around um, talking to our kids about what's happening in the country, talking to our kids about the things that they're seeing on TV and what's going on in our world. Um, and kind of where we left off last week, which was week two with Crystal um, and Kim Earsley from Families of the Treasure Coast was with us last week was, how do you form those relationships with kids? And I think one of the comments that Crystal made was the best way to overcome trauma or to overcome um, negative things that are happening is by making positive connections with a child. And so we thought that the best way to, to have that conversation, to continue that conversation, was with two people who are experts at talking about that. Um, so we're really lucky that in our community, we have Kids at Hope. Um, it's a program run through the Roundtable of St. Lucie County. Um, and Kimberly Reed and Kevin Singletary are those experts. 
experts and they both agreed to join us today. So we're really excited about that. So thank you both of you. Thank you for having us. Those are big shoes to fill, Ashley. <laughs> so it's nice to see your faces because Kim and Kevin actually share an office space with us, but I haven't seen you guys in forever, it feels like. True. I, uh, I, I want to just add on to that a little bit. And I'm going to throw Kim under the bus a little bit. So, so uh -oh. in a <laughs> good way. Me. What's up with that? <laughs> in a good way. In a good way. So, uh, uh, you know, where we, like Ashley said, we talked about the importance of building relationships and relationships with children with positive adult role models. And I think all of us, we didn't say it on the program, we're like thinking kids at hope. So then we replayed the video on <laughs> Facebook. And while I was playing, Kim's like, hey, that's kids at hope. She put it right <laughs> in the comment. So she was totally reading our mind and she had she to did. fully expect for us to say an outreach tour and say, hey, do you and Kevin want to be on the radio program? <laughs> Oddly enough, I didn't see that coming, but I guess I should have, you're right. <laughs> you open that door, so she got. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, you know, in light of, like you said, Ashley, everything that's going on in the world, the importance of connecting with kids, instilling values um, and educating, and it starts all with relationships. So for, people who maybe lived under, under a rock or who just came to our community, uh, can either one of you explain what Kids at Hope is? I'll yield to you, Kim, go ahead. Oh, no, I just, I just did the hand gesture, you didn't see? Go ahead, I already had my moment. <laughs> well, okay, well, Kids at Hope is not a program, it's a philosophical framework where we're looking to change the culture. And when we say by changing the culture, we're talking about changing the mindset, we're changing the language from taking our kids at hope to our kids, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, from taking our kids from being at risk to our kids being at hope. Because there's hope inside of every individual that's walking the face of the earth. And one of the things with children that's so important is we have to build that capacity. Um, I like to borrow Rick's phrase, hope is something that can be taught. Hope is something that we can expand upon through the way that we relate to children. And as you said, and I'll just share these four really quick and I'll let Kim um, elaborate on them. There are four people that our kids need. One is the anchor parent, and we call it the four aces. So the ace, the first ace is the anchor parent, and that's the ace of diamonds. And then our next parent is the ace of club. That's other caring adults. But the thing about that other caring adult, it has to be someone that has a meaningful and sustainable relationship with the child. Unfortunately, we have too many people that come in kids' lives, they're, they're part-time, they're temporary, and then they leave. The other one is an adult that sets high expectations and adults that give them an opportunity to be successful. Kim? Oh, oh tag them in. I, <laughs> I hear I, it. We had, sorry. So there was uh, the little, a little slip of the tongue. So the ace and the anchor parent is the ace of hearts. You already, you yeah. already moved on to diamonds, but it's okay. Um, with all the good stuff ahead, it's no wonder. So um, the ace of spades is high expectations, as Kevin said. And then the ace of diamonds is really giving children an opportunity to succeed. Um, putting them in positions to take on leadership roles, to let them try things they haven't um, done before, maybe that they didn't think they were capable of. And sometimes even adults weren't even sure that they were capable of, but just saying, hey, just give this a shot. One quick analogy that we always kind of uh, share, I, and I'm not a sports person, so don't laugh at me if I get this wrong, but, and especially you, Kevin, but um, when, when basketball, or basketball or football players, they're, you know, the team is large, but we see the same couple of people always in the starting lineup. So, um, for example, if a coach was to say, hey, you know, you, number, whatever, so-and-so that's sitting on the bench, I want you to be in the starting lineup this time because I've been watching you practice the last couple times and your, you know, three-pointers, whatever, have really been, you know, really hitting. So I want you to be in the starting lineup. So that's, that's an opportunity for someone to succeed. That's giving them an opportunity to just do it, even though they haven't been maybe stellar in the past or it doesn't seem to be their strength, but just to say, I'm going to give you a shot, you know. And for kids, as it applies um, what we like to share on trainings is just giving them a chance to do things on their own sometimes as parents, um, as caregivers, teachers, sometimes we do the, the hover hover and let me do it for you sometimes that, you know, for different reasons, just because it goes quicker sometimes or because we never stop to think, hey, they can totally do that on their own. So just to step back and say, I want you to try this this time because I know you can handle it or we've, you've, I've seen you work really hard to do it. So that's another great example of the Ace of Diamonds for opportunities to succeed. And so the Kids of Hope, uh, and I like what you said, Kevin and Kim, that it's not a program, it's an initiative. It's kind of a, like a, a way of thought. It's kind of like, you know, I, I remember when it first rolled out in the community, it was, the analogy was like seatbelts, right? Like 
it's everybody puts on a seatbelt, right? And nobody, you know, but that was a, a big push to get everybody to think, oh, seatbelts, of course you click it, you know, it's no big deal. And so kids that hope the idea that every child is capable of success, no exceptions, we want that to be as commonplace in St. Lucie County as the Mets, the ocean, and <laughs> clicking your seatbelt, if you will. Um, and so, uh, and so, you know, we're, we're coming out of, you know, I say we're coming out of, the, I, don't, I think we're still in it. That was a bad word. We're, we're still in a pandemic. We're coming out of school, uh, but it's really not a big shift for parents because the kids are still home. It's just now maybe they don't have to log on the computer as much. And we have, you know, world events, national events that are, you know, all time, all consuming if you allow them. So in, in, in that, all that atmosphere, if you will, how, like what's a good recommendation for a way for a parent to really connect with a child, e e even if it's not a parent, uh, a caring adult, if you will? Well, I want to, well, one thing I, I'll, I'll throw this aimless, not an aimless plug, but it's a good plug. What we've been offering is a three week series on parent trainings through Kids at Hope. Uh, we have part three this afternoon at six. And one of the reasons we did it at six, because some parents are still working, mm -hmm. but a way of connecting um, the Chinese has a word for crisis. It's called opportunity. And if parents can look at what all of the changes that's going on, these are opportunities. And one of the things that we use in Kids at Hope is um, the moment of truth. So every interaction with the child is a moment of truth. So if they would take these moments of truth and these opportunities, they become teachable moments. How do we, be, how do we use the current changes in our world and what's going on around us to be teachable moments? That's an that's a excellent way of connecting with our kids. Because first of all, our kids, we model what we expect them to do. And one of the things that um, the round table does is we have a lot of information on our website in terms of how to talk to our kids. We want our kids to be resilient from this crisis. One of the others is how to talk about race to our children at the varying age group. So there's a lot of information we have on our website. But one talks about our children feed off for our emotions. So one thing that we have to be mindful of, we don't wanna put undue anxiety on our children. So how do we do that? We model it, we talk about it, but we have to check ourselves first. Where am I at with all of this? And so we have those open and transparent conversations based upon, and I'm not gonna say the age, but the maturity of the child. Too much too soon can be just like water. <laughs> Enough water, the plant grows, too much water, it doesn't grow. So you have to know the right amount of the conversation based upon your child that he or she can have. I think that's really good advice. And, and something that I remember that we talked about last week with Crystal and Kim is that, you know, a lot of times kids want to have those conversations with their parents. They want to know what their parent is thinking or, or how their parent is feeling. And I think sometimes I feel like I have done this as a parent is you try to shelter them from what's going on. I don't want you to see what's on TV. I don't want you to know what's happening out there. It's too, you're too young. It's too hard for you to understand. So you try to kind of push them away from all of that. Um, but th we need to have those conversations. They, they need to know how, as, how we as parents feel about it so that it sort of instills our morals and our values so that those conversations can keep happening. Definitely, so there's something, I guess something practical that I'd, I'd wanna just share um, for maybe any parents, um, any adults really listening as, as far as how to connect with kids. So I'm gonna borrow, not steal, I'm gonna borrow something that we all remember from fire safety, stop, drop and roll. So what I mean by that in terms of conversation is just stop, you ask how you can connect, just stop for a minute, stop what you're doing because I know, especially being at home for me, I'm constantly putzing around doing every and anything. There's always something to do. So just stop for a minute. The drop part is either get to your child's physical level, you know, kneel down, crouch down, get eye level. Um, it could be in terms of a maturity level, like Kevin said, with conversation and roll with them in terms of the flow of conversation. 
talk about anything, ask them what they want to talk and just roll with them, flow with whatever it is that that's on their mind, on their heart, you know, plant a seed maybe if they're kind of like, oh, I don't know, what are we doing here, mom? This is new. I'm not sure how to handle this. What do you want from me? But, you know, ask them a quick question and it takes off. I mean, kids love to talk. We know this because we spend a lot of our time getting them not to <laughs> often, but um, so that part isn't, you know, isn't difficult, but flow with them and see, because that way you can hear what's on their heart, what's important to them. Sometimes what we think is important or what should be the focus or you know, might be is totally not like, mom, I'm not thinking about, you know, whatever I just saw on TV. I'm thinking about, you know, how can I, you know, work out a play date with my friend next door <laughs> right now, you know, so just roll with them. So maybe that's something just brief and, and tangible that people can work with stop, drop and roll. You got me excited there for a minute when you said stop and you said the phone. I was like, yes, and then definitely drop it and then roll it on the ground <laughs> so that that distraction is out of there. But I, that that, too? <laughs> but I like yours better. It's less, you don't have to buy a new phone otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and real quick, I just want to clarify for uh, our viewers and listeners, uh, Kevin referenced the class. We're actually pre-recording this on a I don't even know what day this is, Tuesday. Um, but so, so that's okay. We forgot to mention that when we, before we uh, hit record. But uh, uh, all that information, real quick, on, is on your website, the classes? Right. The classes on our website. The, the, the um, tips are also on our website, and they're also on our Facebook page. So there's tons of information that parents can access and how to navigate during this time of change. I don't call them times of difficulty because what they are, they're times of change. Um, we determine how difficult or how easy the transition is going to be, but we're in a time of change and all change is not necessarily bad change. And, and real quick, the website, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, St. Louis, oh, I'm sorry, Roundtable. At 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 Roundtable SLC. Uh, com. I, I should have rephrased that and said, finish my phrase. I, I just, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong and I was wrong right from the get-go. So roundtableslc.com. And also you can look up Roundtable St. Lucie on Facebook. Are you guys recording those classes? Um, we recorded one. We, we're not, we haven't recorded all of them. <laughs> and you're um, like, and based on that first one, we're like, yeah, we're not recording. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually it, it went really well, but um we just decided maybe the next round because we're going to do them again. Um, oh, good. I did the one on um, parent training. Kim's going to be starting a series. We haven't come up with a date yet on ACES tracking. And mm -hmm. uh, from there, we're going to develop a lot more different types of trainings for parents and the community because we're living in a virtual world. So, yeah. so we're going to have, make those available um, virtual trainings for the community. I think so, that's awesome. I think, honestly, I think that's going to open the door to a lot more people. You guys have trained so many people in our community in the way of school district personnel, cities, county employees, just people that, you know, kids would come in contact with. But the group that I think maybe didn't get that opportunity is parents. And so being able to do it this way is going to make a big difference. I think I'm, I'm excited about it. So in regards to stop drop and roll because I'm, I'm, that's going to stay in my mind for a while and i'm always going to think about what you said kim but i'm also going to think about everybody just stopping dropping and dropping their phone <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you know ashley and, and and kim and kevin you guys mentioned about listening to our kids and, and and obviously assessing the maturity but starting where they're at but you know there's one common theme that has come across our last three shows including this one and that's the word listening and so I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not throw you under the bus. That's not the right word. But I'm just going to put you on the spot a little bit, Ashley and Kim, uh, because you have young kids. Um, you know, my kid's 19. I, you, know, you know, you could argue the maturity level <laughs> sometimes. But, <laughs> but it, you know, I think my conversations with him are a little bit more direct because, you know, he, he watches the news. And, you know, but with, your, with the younger kids, um, with everything that's going on, like what have been, what have been your strategies? Because you know people are listening and they can hear what we're saying. You know, make sure you listen. But sometimes you know people learn by examples and what other people did. So I'm just curious, how are you guys in, engaging your kids in this discussions? Do okay. you want to go first? Do you want me to? Sure. Go first? You give me that look like <laughs> tag you're it. I know. Right? <laughs> so. Um, well, my son is uh, three. He just turned three. So we really haven't roped him in a whole lot. His world is, um, I don't know, team Zoomy Zoom and swimming <laughs> lessons right now. So whatever that is. Um, and I'm happy that he, you know, he can stay there, definitely. 
Um, my daughter is nine, so there's a complete different awareness that we're dealing with at nine, of course. Um, you know, she hears peace, well, she hears way more than we think, I know. Um, whether it's the TV or, you know, us having sidebar conversations or responding to something on our good old Facebook. Um, you know, my husband and I dialogue and, and she's just getting snippets. Anyway, um, I see the opportunity to just speak with her. I'm, I mean, most of you know, I'm a pretty straight shooter. <laughs> for better or for worse, I'm a pretty straightforward, you know, when it comes to that. And I just have chosen that path really with her as well. So um, without going into, you know, too graphic, I'm going to say details. Um, we spoke about um, the climate and uh, what's happening as it relates. Um, my husband, her father is biracial. It's not, he's not biracial. He's Jamaican. She's biracial. Um, he's Jamaican. So it's, you know, it's very close to home for us on many different levels. Um, so it, the conversation needed to happen to know, you know, without scaring her, she's very, um, she's really wise, but she's also very delicate, very sensitive in terms of, you know, bleeding heart. I have no idea where she gets that from, by the way. Um, so I had to be really, you know, really careful with her to say, hey, this is what's happening. And her question was, you know, but it's really far away from us, mommy, right? It's really, but it's not here, right? Like how many hours drive is it away? Like that's always her concern, is it right here? So to have to say, you know, we're not protected from that. Like it is in different um, ways and magnitudes and levels. It is in our backyard, you know, in, in certain things. So um, anyway, that was a really long version to say, just direct conversation. Um, again, going back to maturity level, not so much age appropriate. We know what we mean by that, really maturity level and, and personality level too, just kind of where they are. You know, I know we know how to handle, I think for the most part, our children based on what we know of them. And so just kind of, again, meet them where they are. I, I think that's a really good point. I have, my kids are 10, 9 now and 6. Um, but my nine-year-old and 10-year-old, while they're very close in age, they are not close in maturity level. So I can have a very different conversation with my 10-year-old than I can with my nine-year-old. And, and they, um, my nine-year-old is pretty go with the flow, like nothing really bothers her a whole lot. My 10-year-old is very different. And so she has had questions and we've had situations in our family where people have pointed out that we look different than our kids do. So, you know, it's not just a conversation that we're having right now. It's a conversation that we have had to have before. And I think, Kim, you probably would agree with that. I mean, I don't, it's, for us, it's, it's not just something that's going on now. It's, it's happened previously. Um, but I think that it is, it opens a door to have a healthy conversation about it um, and, you know, like I said, it goes back to instilling what our values are as a family and how we think people should be treated rather than them, you know, whatever kids are saying to them when they're at school or whatever they're learning from what they're watching on TV. Um, we try to make sure that we have really diverse books in our house because our family doesn't look the same. Um, so, you know, that's something that we've had to be really cognizant of as they've grown up. Um, but certainly the conversation that we have, my six-year-old could care less. He thinks that he, like, the world does whatever he wants it to do. Um, so we haven't really had that conversation too much with him. But with the girls, for sure, um, we've, we've had to have some serious talks about what it means when people say the things they say and why they called you that. Like, it's, you know... Um, it's, it's difficult. It's challenging sometimes. But I think the more open and honest we are with our kids, the better chance we're giving them when, you know, five years from now, let's hope we're not still having this conversation. Absolutely. And I think it's important for us as parents to try and stay I don't know, ahead of the game as much as possible um, so that we're not too forward when we get some of those questions, you know, we're uh, in the same boat. I remember just really quick being at an event where my daughter was two. It was for a former employer. It was a, like a, a fair, like a, not a job fair, but some kind of an expo type thing. And my daughter was with me and somebody, one of the other vendors asked me, uh, she said, uh, where did you get her? And I was like, what do you mean? Where did I get her? She's like, well, did you adopt her? I said, no, like I gave birth to her. But it was like, it was such an odd question too. Like, where did I get her? So yeah, I'm not sure my face is like, all kinds of crazy. But 
Um, you know, I'm glad that happened when she was so young that she didn't, you know, catch that, but I was, you just never know. So yeah, conversation. I know <laughs> Ashley has told me similar stories as well. And, and, yeah. you know, and I'm going to, we got like 30 seconds left. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bring Kevin back into this conversation because Kevin, you said something about this isn't a conflict or I don't remember what word it was, but this is a time of change. Right. And change oftentimes before we move forward, it's uncomfortable before we move forward. That's part of changing. And, and I can't help but think, and this is the optimistic in me, and don't laugh, Ashley. This is the optimist in me that if we have these connections with our kids now, um, we're going to raise a generation that's better than what we are. And that, that sounds bad, but you know what I mean? More open-minded and more kind and more loving and understanding that importance. Um, but it starts with us teaching our kids now and connecting with them. Uh, and it's so easy to not connect because there's so many technologies and different distractions. And man, I really sound old saying that, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so Kevin, real quick, uh, kind of take us out on, you know, how people can get involved and learn more about it. Um, and particularly, obviously, the Kids at Hope. Well, the way they can learn more about Kids at Hope is that we can, they can actually call us. I'll give our numbers, 772-979-1575. That's directly to me. For Kim, it's 772-240-2606. Um, I will not give you the office numbers because we're not in the office. <laughs> <laughs> um, our emails or our first initial, our last name at roundtableslc.org. So um, that's the easiest way to get in touch with us. Like I said, we're on Facebook, we're on the website, but in this time of change, we have to embrace change. And I think um, one of the things that Ashley said, we don't want to shield them from failure. We want to protect them from danger. We don't, we don't protect them from disaster, but we protect them from danger. And we don't choreograph their success. We let them grow into their success. So if we are able to provide that boundary, that healthy boundary where they can grow and nurture them, they're going to be all right. Because we still have these conversations. Your guys' kids are small. Sean, I have a 19-year-old as well, but my oldest is 35. But we still have these tough conversations. And my 32-year-old calls every day. We talk every day about these tough conversations because he wants to rear his family correctly. So it doesn't stop. We continue to grow. So, uh, First of all, let me just quickly say, I do have a 22-year-old. I don't want her to think I don't recognize her <laughs> as well. But this is why, as a host, I knew to let Kevin have the last word because he totally summed it up perfectly. I want to thank everybody for tuning in and or watching. It's a weekly radio program every Sunday at 10 a.m. and apparently a Zoom show as long as we keep doing it this way. And remember, it's our children, our community, our future. More than ever, we're all in this together. All right, so thanks for tuning into the show, but this is the cool part. This is the after show. So your treat is we're going to continue this conversation. So uh, in past shows, we've talked about how important it is that uh, families connect. And one way to do that is to make sure that they're enrolled in activities in the summer. So they're not just sitting around watching TV and being on the computer all day. Um, but my understanding is kids at Hope, Kim and Kevin, you guys are working with some of our summer programs? We are definitely. So we have a few things at the horizon that we've got going on um, and, and some things that are going on right now. So one thing that, um, well, let me rewind just a little bit. So one thing that's super duper important, we talked about, you know, connections and relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's really important to pad our kids with ACEs as much as possible. So ACEs, caring adults basically in their lives, um, just so that they are there as their sounding board, their buffer, their support, their, you know, belief system, their cheerleaders, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing um, to strengthen our kids, we thought we need to strengthen and equip our ACEs too in the community. So um, one thing that we came up with was a strategy to um, support uh, the summer camp staff as a pilot project. So you guys are the first to hear. So um, it's a pilot project that we're launching with, or we have launched with the city of Fort St. Lucie with their summer camp staff. So I've trained them for the last two years. And it's been, you know, great, um, good training, whatever. But then it's like, all right, well, here you go. You're equipped, you know, go go to your thing. And there's a little follow-up to say, well, how are they, like, we don't really know how are they implementing, you know, what they've taken away from the training, if they took anything away from the training, et cetera, et cetera. So how does that really look? Um, Kevin and I did pop up uh, last year there to do some ACES tracking. And it was, um, we got a sneak peek and we're like, yeah, maybe we need to revisit the training or some follow-up, you know, how that could look. 
I'm not saying that it was horrible by any means at all, but it was just, there was, there's always room for improvement as we know with anything that we, you know, we um, take on. So um, fast forward to this year, um, I did a virtual training with the summer camp staff, which is interesting because um, I was like on this big screen TV, I guess, in front of all the staff. So when they, I asked them something, they responded. I was like, so somebody had to come up to the computer. Like I heard you bits and pieces and we had a coach. So they said, and he said, and she said, so it was interesting, <laughs> but we made it work. Uh, we went with the flow, but from there, so there needs to be follow-up. So uh, we created a kids at home journal is what we're calling it. And each week is specific to um, a different area of kids at home. So we have a uh, last week was uh, the we believe portion, the first universal truth. This week is all about connection. And so we've asked the staff to complete this journal. Um, the first two weeks are on a daily basis. And um, so we've got their Monday through Friday and the following weeks, the remaining seven weeks are on a weekly basis. And there are very specific questions in there such as um, let me see if I can do it off the cuff. Like, what's um, give share one example of one way that you let a camper know that you believed in them today? So they would, you know, write whatever it is. You know, I cheered them on during a game and said, I know you can do it. And, you know, even if you're not the fastest runner, I know that you can, you know, something like that. Um, and, and it helped them. There are other elements there. There's probably maybe six questions or so um, for the day. It was, first of all, how did you enter camp without like regurgitating the whole thing, but with which, um, on a scale from one to 10, how did you come to camp today as a staff person um, and your belief system of you believe all children are capable of success, no exceptions. So they would rate themselves how they came in with which attitude. So we said that makes all the difference, how you, you know, start, what is your view starting out? And then I also asked the same question at the end of the day. At the end of your day at work, how did you leave? You know, are you still at a 10? Or you're like, yeah, I don't know. Today was kind of rough. I think it took me down to a nine or an eight. Um, and the questions uh, in the middle are reflective, not only for the campers, like what did they do, but how did the staff members feel? How did you feel using the language of hope? What change did you notice in yourself when you use the language of hope with a camper? And I'll tell you that I've read just um, a week's worth now of journals and I've got goosebumps, I've got a little misty-eyed. Um, it's been really powerful to hear um, the staff reflecting. I mean, first of all, applying. Like we know now that they're focusing on, okay, my mission is to believe this week, you know, or my, my purpose is to connect, not to say that one need to exclude the other, but that they've really been focused on what they're doing and um, implementing it and feeling it themselves. And so some of the responses that we've gotten so far from how it's impacted them is, I feel, um, I feel more encouraged myself, or I feel, you know, happier, I feel like I'm making a difference, or I know, you know, like, I now treat the kids with more enthusiasm or whatever, so just to see, like, kind of that come full circle has been amazing, and we're super excited to see what the rest of the weeks are going to bring, so we've, we're addressing time travel, the areas of time travel, the destinations, um, ACEs, um, it's a lot of good stuff, so we're super duper excited, and um, we're also going to compare and contrast what happened, not what happened, but how this has made a difference, to, or is making a difference with the journal to the last few years when there was no journal, because some of the staff are returning uh, staff members from past years, so we're excited to just kind of hear if we're, you know, barking up the right tree with this thing, or if, if it's a miss, but so far it's looking really good. That's, That's really interesting, cool. yeah. What? One of the things is um, John Maxwell, he has a book or he's a, um, he does leadership and he has a book called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. So two of the principles with this pilot program is the law of momentum and the law of buy-in. Because um, he used the analogy that you can take a rock and you put it in front of a locomotive before it gets started, you can hold it up. But once it gets started and that train's moving, it'll just crush that rock. But the other thing with Kids at Hope is the staff with the law of buy-in. If people are believing what they're teaching and training and implementing every day, kids really feel that. It's not, I'm checking the box, but this becomes a part of who I am. And if we're going to change the community, we have to really have that law of buy-in where we really, at all times, no matter what's going on around us, we believe that every child is capable of success. And that's really how we change the culture. Um, Rick Miller says this, you can't have kids at hope until you have adults at hope. And it's so important for the adults to have true buy-in to what they're doing. Not another check in the box, but this is who I am and this is who I'm becoming. And this is a part of who, of me. Yeah. And are you doing that, that, that camp? Are you doing that? Is that just city of Port St. Lucie or are you spreading that across multiple camps? So right now, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Mm -hmm. No, the plan is we're looking to do multiple camps. But right now, um, well, Sean, you know that we're still in some discussions about a few other things with some of the other um, programs this summer. Oh, so okay. we're just waiting to get the okay on that. And we're looking to launch it uh, countywide. That's exciting. Because, you know, you're right. Until, you know, to change behavior, to make it kind of uh, rote, if you will, built in, you have to you have to be cognizant of it and you have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it until it becomes automatic. So that sounds like the journaling aspect is really going to make them think every single day. And, you know, after a while, it's just going to become, you know, part of their routine, if you will. That's a right. great idea. Kind of cool. One of the, um, the, the coordinators that I've been working with to kind of get this all started. Um, she called me the other day. I was so excited. She said, I have a story, like a testimonial to share with you. And I said, okay, let me have it. I'm ready. I got my tissues ready. I'm ready. So, um, she said she goes, it was really small, but it was really big at the same time. Basically, one of the staff members was struggling with uh, a challenging child there, was given uh, given uh, him a run for his money in terms of his you know, behavior. And um, she, what she said as guidance to the staff member was, well, have you tried to time travel with him? And she said, Kim, it just kind of popped out. Like, I don't even know where that came <laughs> from, but it just popped out. And, uh, and he looked at me like I had three heads. So she explained to him a little bit more, well, you know, ask him what he wants to be when he grows up, which I'm like, Okay, we know there's more to time travel now, but I let it slide <laughs> to the you know, beginnings. Um, anyway, and so, and he, the staff member took that on, what she told him, and tried it. And he said that he came back the next day, was so refreshed and like energetic and was like ready to go and just was able to connect with that child because of it. And then, therefore, that, you know, disruptive behavior decreased too. So it just, it's really cool to see, like Sean said, you know, like it, it saturates, you know, at some point when it saturates kind of your, your, your mindset, then it just, pops out like she said she goes, I don't know where it came from but it just there it was so that's really cool to see the changes and we're hoping that that's just going to be a continuum that it just kind of you know spreads like a good pandemic you know I guess the um, belief system throughout the camp and that, that's really you know the the whole idea of the journaling is that something because I know you guys have trained a lot of schools and I'm even thinking of you know parents and grandparents you know to have like a, a, a you know a sheet or a reminder somewhere um, it's kind of like your to-do list that you make, you know, like today, <laughs> connect with a kid <laughs> today. You know, uh, is that something you guys are going to make widely available? I think we're going to explore it definitely um, with some of our community partners for trainings, because that's something that Kevin and I have talked about a lot is that a lot of times, depending on which, um, you know, agency or organization is, there's, there's little, um, I don't want to say there's no follow-up to make it so like we don't check or, you know, check in with one another, but to see how is it really being implemented, observation maybe more so of how it's implemented because we can't, you know, hang out there all day, every day for a week to say, you know, this is kind of what we see. Um, but I think it's just a, it, an effective way to just keep it alive and fresh and where we can get some feedback and piggyback off of the feedback that we get through the journal to say, hey, we can, you know, this is where we can provide some, you know, technical assistance per se, or some brainstorming or some, do some modeling, you know, on site. That's really purposeful because it gives us an idea really of what, what is needed, you know, more so than anything else. Well, and it, I'm sure it's, you know, it's good self-reflection for the staff members too, because I've worked those jobs before. It's really easy to walk away from a long day and think about all the things that went wrong that day, like all the struggles that you had. But when you sit down and you have to pay attention to the things that happened that were good, then, you know, you kind of, it kind of brings you back to, oh, that did happen. And yeah, okay, I did have an impact on that kid today. So, you know, it, it, focusing in the right places, too, makes a big difference. Right. That's actually our Friday wrap up for on the journal. The last page is not question. Well, there are questions, but not the same questions. It's what was the most rewarding experience you had this week at camp and why? And what was the most challenging one that you had at camp yeah. and why? And did you, which, re, um, which support was needed or did you receive to, to handle that? So we've, we built in a lot of components, I think, that are just Sounds awesome. all the way around. Yeah, we're really excited to see it come to life. So we'll keep you posted. You yeah. know, dur during this pandemic, I, uh, I thought it was a great idea before it got too crazy. Uh, uh, I saw online somewhere, I read an article where Yale was offering a class called The Science of Wellbeing for free. And I thought, oh, sure, why not? It'll be fun because I'll, you know, I, you know, I'll have time to do it. You know, it was a real class with real homework and real papers. So that part was kind of stressful, but I got through it. <laughs> and, uh, and what I learned was exactly similar to what you just said, that, you know, it's not the things that we think will make us happy. There's science that bears out that, you know, making a ton of money is not going to make you happy. Buying the newest thing will not make you happy. 
It's all about connections and relationships and thankfulness and gratitude. Um, and really, when you said reflect on the end of the day of what, you know, what you know, happened that was good or that you're grateful for, that's, that's science. That's built in. There's studies that show that that alone will make you happier. So uh, We're ahead kinda, of the game. We were experts and didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. So my point is, is even if you're watching this and you're like, Sean, Ashley, Kevin, Kim, my kids, you know, they're 19 and 22 or 37. This doesn't apply to me. No, this applies to you in everything that you do, even if it's not about kids, even if it's just about reflecting on your own day and thinking about what you're thankful for and gra grateful for that. I mean, you know, it sounds silly, but it sounds so obvious, but I mean, literally there are s multiple studies that were done that show that that alone will raise your overall happiness by a good percentage. You, you said something when it comes to kids, because Kim and Ashley have smaller kids. You and I, we have adult children. Yeah. But I They're also still have kids, right? <laughs> and I have grandchildren. It's funny, their need for us changes, but they still need us. Yeah. And the way that they come to us, we're still doing the same things about being an anchor parent at this age, but I'm just talking to someone that's in their 30s because they just need us differently at certain stages in life but there's still the need for the parent. And I think we can all think about that. We still need our parents, even at our ages. And we have varying ages on this call, I mean, amongst the four of us. But the one thing, the still the premises and the foundation of Kids at Hope, I'm still using that with the adult children, just like I use it with my grandchildren. <laughs> and this, these are lifelong things. These are things that you don't ever take out. These are foundational things. Right. that I will not, I will continue to use the rest of my life in whatever capacity. I work with children or adults or whomever because they don't go away. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. All right. I think, uh, I think, you know, Kevin, you got the end, you got the last end <laughs> of the, the half hour radio program. I think we're going to leave it here with those words of wisdom that you just said, because you're right. The Kids at Hope philosophy is a universal philosophy for parents of all ages. And quite honestly, just in working with people and being a good person, <laughs> which is something that we need times a hundred nowadays. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks guys. Well, thank, Appreciate you guys. It. Right. thank you. Thank you.